वंदना करते हैं हम तेरी वंदना करते हैं हम शक्ति देना मुझको मेरा नहीं कोई में जीवन को मेरे ले लो गाँव में तेरे ही गी जीवन को मेरे ले लो गाँव में तेरे ही गी वंदना करते हैं हम तेरी वंदना करते हैं हम वंदना करते हैं हम वंदना करते हैं हम थैंक यू सर थैंक यू मिस लारा डोनाल्ड फॉर ए प्रेयर सॉन्ग नाउ आई प्लेजर टू इनवाइट डॉक्टर एन त्रिलोक चंद्र एकेडमिक इंचार्ज एट इंडियन कलरी इंस्टीट्यूट तिरुपति ओवर टू Dr. Tirlok Chandar. Good morning, all the participants. And also, good morning to others who are watching this program over uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube. I know that uh, we have uh, informed some of the stakeholders because of our maximum limit to join in the YouTube and the Facebook. We are all excited, sir, because for the two reasons. One is our director, sir, uh, senior bureaucrat, Jan Bhushan, sir, again joining in this webinar. The second one is a very famous chef. His book started in 2011. It became a past one decade. It became like a bible for the food production faculty member for the students both in IHM and ICA level. And uh, we are uh, uh, blessed and excited to have both of you on the screen. Uh, first, uh, I think no introduction is required for our, um, I mean, uh, director sir. But some of the newly joined, just I want to tell you, is a very senior bureaucrat in mm -hmm. the government of India. Good. Can you, know, you hear me? I was disconnected. For what? Uh, morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry, I had been logged out as guest. Yes. Am I audible now? Yes, sir, audible, audible. Sir, so we will continue with that. Uh, yes. Sir, just I like to. I was just uh, giving my welcome address. Thank uh, you. To recall that that we are all very excited to have you on the screen and our director, sir, Mr. Jan Bhushan, we getting on the service. A senior bureaucrat looking after uh, IHM as a CEO and looking after Indian Culinary Institute and other ministerial work. And uh, why I am mentioning this to all the participants today? A webinar. It all started from Sir because still I remember in month of January 2011, 2020. He gave me a call. He said, "Tell me, why don't you organize a demonstration, come guest lecture for a uh, Arvindaraya Swami? Because it's quite popular. Why we have not done anything in ICA?" Then I replied to him, "Sir, just know we have started a new semester in the month of January." And second year students, both uh, IC Tirupati and uh, Noida, they have gone for a training. Said so we will do it in month of uh, March, first week or something like that. I just promised him. He also said, okay, you concentrate on academic activities, then we will organize the training for that. But it so happened, all uh, situation had done prevailing condition, very unfortunate situations. But added to that, that has given uh, some sort of advantage to us that we are able to organize this webinar with a virtual platform. 
and really i thank uh, our director sir for giving that uh, initiative and he gave me the int that i should do it sir just i want to tell uh, assure your director sir last time when you spoke to our students it's not only encouraging very motivating most of the student have sent a very good feedback on your speech and they are feeling little confident and enlightened that something good is going to happen even in normal sentence and also you also shared your feedback about your program sir thank you very much personally thanking me and the organizing committee sir we have done certain improvements in today's program also in the, from the students point of view as well as uh, starting the program hope we will continue with all your blessings sir and your guidance till i remember that uh, last uh, webinar speech sir i think i am sure that today also all the participants will be benefited with your speech so on behalf of all the participants at their organizing committee i extend warm welcome to gyan roshan sir indian economic service senior peer from minister for government of india sir another excitement for me is uh, chef patavinder bali as i said that our director gave me a call in the month of jan it started from there sir i still remember as a student in the 80s nayacham institute of water management chennai we had lots of book written by padmasri tangam pilli those days that was a bible both for the faculty members and for the library as well as the theory So, look, sir, your voice is not audible. Uh, please unmute. Yeah. Now, can you hear yes, me? Sir. Yes. Yes. Sir. So, when I become a head of the department, when uh, my my first uh, briefing with the principal used to go for a rounds, I had seen so many faculty members in staff room keeping the department the rest body book, doing a reference, preparing mm -hmm. a PPT, preparing a OHP speeches, and everything. Then I went to library also. The library also students were having your book and. Yeah. <laughs> So I was so excited that time itself. Then I asked the librarian, "If you want urgently for our institute, you tell me so that we will. I'll take it to principal next day meeting and approve." But very surprised, not that you are there. I want to share, share this information. He gave me first name, sir, because most the students are interested in book production. So we need uh, lots of more uh, number of books of that So mm -hmm. that was the thing. I'm very happy to introduce to all the participants that he is a corporate chef of OCLD. Obroy Center of Learning and Development. Plus, he has got his certified hospitality educator from American Hotel Lodging Association, and also he is a chef de cuisine of American Culinary Institute, and he has been appointed as a chef de cuisine of American Federation Culinary Institute. Also, we saw this background. He has got it. What lots of experience, written good number of food production books, and he is very passionate with the Indian cuisine. Because when we discussed with this topic, also he was very much happy about this topic which he want to deliver to all the students. He has got he has suggested some more topics also to me, sir. I am sure that times to come in near future we will be able to organize some more uh, webinars, lectures to both I say culinary institute of Tirupati and uh, this one. So in the presence of uh, our director, I would extend the invitation to both the institute because both newly constituted institute newly we are coming up. Under uh, Minister of Tourism, Amrila, so you should be able to come to our institute and do a live demonstration, and this will benefit our students, and we'll be able to organize some theme festival based on your inputs also, sir. So with yes, this, I don't know definitely. This, yes, sir. Much time, but I like to invite, welcome all the organizing committee, especially Dr. Lumpli and uh, Dr. Sunil, and and uh, Manupam uh, uh, Alok, who is going to give a vote of thanks. And all my students, both I say Tirupati and Noida, I extend warm welcome. I know some of them also parents, and some of them also stakeholders are watching this program. I extend warm welcome on behalf of Indian Culinary Institute. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Now I like to invite uh, Mr. Sri uh, Gyan Bhushan sir to address the participants. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Pranav ji, uh, thank you very much for this morning um, organization of this particular webinar. I am. Uh, uh, is my voice uh, clear? 
Yes, yes it is. Okay. Yes. So uh, I'm really glad to see Chef Bali after such a long time because I mm-hmm. remember uh, we met at uh, Amritsar where uh, Chef Gill has organized an event. Yes. World level chefs who had came down to Amritsar, and mm-hmm. I re- very clearly remember those days, and it 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 looks like a dream now because of the situation. But let me welcome you first of all, and I'm really Thank thankful you. on behalf of the Indian Culinary Institute at and and Ministry of Tourism uh, that you have spared your valuable time and uh, sharing your experience on this. I would like to uh, you know welcome all the students uh, particularly uh, because uh, they are the ones who are really also going through this. Uh, Uh, difficult times i would say in the last yeah. webinar also which we organized we have uh, really appreciated their joining their patience because as we have to keep patience in this time uh, we are also struggling with the technology part today morning i think some somehow my also i also got disconnected uh, chef bali also got disconnected <laughs> so uh, the the bottom line is that uh, have patience in life that's the very important thing especially as we grow older we have more patience but in the younger times you have to be more patient with this time so uh, i am very glad that uh, professor uh, professor trilog has organized uh, this uh, webinar and uh, i am also thankful to mr uh, uh, the the rd i don't know whether rd has joined regional director south has joined or not but i i saw his message so he was also supposed to join and uh, other faculty members who are also working Uh, night and day i mean very difficult times uh, they are all working from uh, difficult conditions and all that uh, health everything but they have organized this uh, very well and uh, this is keeping us connected and keeping us uh, updated because this is the time which we generally do not get in normal official time when there are so many other engagements so this is a time which which we can utilize productively by sharing our knowledge and experience and skills so i'm uh, i'm glad uh, that uh, today morning it has actually being organized um i would not be very very uh, uh, long but i would only uh, say few things one one is of course that you know our this pandemic has really taught us how important our heritage and our tradition has been which is uh, now so many things are getting validated Uh, during this uh, difficult times which is happening after almost 100 years when the spanish flu uh, came in 1918 so and people have started uh, researching now that every 100 year there is some event like this where this is a the, the challenge comes from uh, nature on the humanity as such and that challenge has to be taken a lot of learning points came out of these uh, episodes and we have to come out with those uh, learning points amend our ways amend our uh, way of life amend so many other things so that uh, we survive and and we grow uh, as we have been growing till now so uh, the indian tradition has come very handy in this and indian tradition has taught us that a uh, uh, lot of things we we forget a lot of things which uh, we have not adhered to Uh, we are uh, you know condemned to uh, remind for those uh, particular uh, things in life so uh, this is a important learning phase for us all of us uh, to uh, you know learn and grow faster i would uh, i think today uh, uh, chef gill i think whatever can be said about uh, chef gill is less i would say because uh, i was just going through uh, some of your uh, work uh, because uh, you are a legend in that uh, area and i could see especially the patiala cuisine the kashmir cuisine your connection with the uh, kashmir as a childhood uh, i think those things are really uh, quite nostalgic for you i'm sure and uh, for that i think i i would say that um, this is a good time for you as well you you must be enjoying and our students are more than uh, obliged to you and we are also quite uh, obliged to you for sparing your time uh, your your uh, long association with the american and i was seeing that uh, with the cia uh, in fact uh, when i visited cia napa valley i could see how the ecosystem entirely so 
as far as the hard infrastructure at ICI, we are somewhat not close, but somewhat uh, trying to catch up. But in terms of software, in terms of the you know people, uh, and that we have to really augment uh, with the skeleton uh, people right now. We have, we mm. are trying to, but this Corona has really taken us slightly back. But uh, we will come out of it definitely. Uh, so I'm very glad, and you know on the uh, you know the topic today, as you all know, tourism is about experiential tourism now. So people are coming for experience as a whole. I was just wondering whether any kind of standalone cuisine can be a reason for tourism, that people only come to a particular food or cooking. I think there are cases where the primary aim is to have cuisine. For example, I can tell you. Uh, you know, people go to from Delhi. A lot of people travel to Murthal, for example. They go in the morning, come back in the evening. Technically, they may not be a tourist as such because they are not staying overnight there for 24 hours. But still, mm. people, a lot of people go to Murthal, just have those uh, food, and then come back uh, back to uh, Delhi. Yeah, These kind of day trips are uh, becoming more popular as people have more uh, you know, steady income. Uh, they would be doing such kind of things more and, and people want to be different that just to sometimes show off also that have you tasted people are talking about in Peru a particular kind of there so have you tasted that or a, in Atlantic salmon have you tasted it? and how fresh do, have you tasted it 15 days old or a month old uh, keeping in the deep fridge or a fresh one so th this kind of thing will grow as we uh, move uh, mm -hmm. along the timeline. So, in, uh, so today, you know, the topic of this uh, uh, Kashmir, is so, uh, Kashmir cuisine was one, as you, you, you would be uh, talking about it. Uh, I think uh, a few things which are very important for experiential tourism. One is, of course, the history, which you will uh, talk about, his history and legacy of that particular cuisine. Then what kind of hygiene is becoming very important. So what kind of hygiene we are going to have it? What kind of nutrition? This is a new dimension which is coming. Earlier, people may not understand exactly what is the chemistry of this particular cuisine. But now people are talking more about. If you go, uh, people are saying, you know, the name of the cuisine and in bracket, they write how much calorie it contains. So and <laughs> as we go along, we will be seeing more of it. In fact, break off of that calorie. How much mm. is the protein? How much is the uh, carbohydrate and other things? So mm. the nutrition and the cuisine uh, chemistry is also going to be very important. The ingredients are, uh, you know, I, I cannot be able to explain much better than what uh, you guys can do it. So ingredients and the recipe. The, the, the fifth, I, uh, you know, I just noted that presentation as chef will always now and uh, Chef Bali, I mean, you also have been emphasizing this point that how presentation of the yeah, yeah. Indian food, Indian uh, cuisine is very important uh, to attract foreign as well as domestic. So how do you uh, make it more interesting? And I would say that uh, documentation is all, again very important. How do you document it? So right now, when today, uh, this is second uh, webinar, I have asked Mr. Tolok and uh, to you know document all these things which are there so that uh, you know once you have uh, something on record it should be there uh, for the students to learn and it uh, becomes very easy for them. And last but not the least, I would say, is the entire this thing is making business sense or not? I think the you know this is a world where without business or without a, a financial issue. You cannot move forward. Whatever your grand thinkings are there. I come from a finance background. So I, I know the importance of it. Otherwise, great ideas are killed like this. It never see the light of the day because it is not making any business uh, you know, uh, sense in that sense. Uh, and uh, because people are talking about revenue management and we have uh, tied up with uh, uh, you know, Cornell School, Hotel School also now. And there also revenue management thing is, is so much emphasized that uh, we have to have uh, this kind of dimension to the entire issue as well. So um, I would not um, uh, uh, spend uh, more time because uh, if I go into the 
big data and other things. <laughs> uh, uh, Sir Bali is aware of uh, the initiative taken by Chef Gill uh, that how we can go into big data and how the chemistry, you know, cross dimensional issue of entire gamut of research can be brought into the entire uh, thing. So I would not go there, but uh, for today, I think you, the students are eagerly waiting to listen to Chef and uh, all the very best to all of you. And I hope this would be a fruitful and very encouraging, uh, uh, you know, uh, webinar series for all of us and, and especially the students. So thank you very much. Um, uh, so I will leave here. I will stop here. And all the very best to all of you for this uh, event and this day. Enjoy uh, Chef uh, Gil, uh, Chef uh, Bali and the other faculty about uh, this entire webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, that you rightly pointed out about the uh, regional director. I think yesterday he had conveyed the message that he has got a very important official commitment okay. that he has to coordinate a webinar uh, with the Vishal Patman Education Department. So he got excused, okay. but he sent a very uh, message uh, uh, to all the participants and the chef and to you. And he want uh, his best wishes for this program also. So hope I, I rightly you said that pointed out that next webinar or the next few uh, few more webinars which we are going to have, he'll be joining and then he'll be talking to our students also. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, really, I would like to uh, thank uh, from my bottom of heart from all the participants spared a time on a Saturday where you addressed valid point on patience because this is a way faculty members also keep on telling to our students have a little patience even this uh, COVID nineteen mm -hmm. also students are asking. So when the normals is returning, when we are going to come to college, <laughs> so we use the word only, be patient, because this has to come from the government yeah. side. We cannot just take the thing. Very rightly pointed out. And one more, you are the core speech on that, how we convert from ingredients to presentation. How the so many things, rightly, I don't want to repeat that, very rightly pointed out. Regarding the nutrition, sir, some sort of, uh, I mean, uh, your input, I don't know, because organizing committee, we know that. The next uh, lecture is going to be on that uh, culinary nutrition expert. She's from, uh, yes. we have already planned, she's from New Zealand. She's right. having books, Kellogg's in New Zealand. I think the mm -hmm. topic is what the sir was mentioning about that. Mm -hmm. How all the students, because I, I presume some of the students, apart from uh, coming to a culinary area, they might go to a late area to calculate mm -hmm. this stuff. Okay. Already we are giving enough input on National Institute of Nutrition, how they do calculate, but she's going to be another uh, speaker. Sir rightly pointed out that this is also a broad area of culinary, culinary uh, data. So thank you once again. And uh, again, on behalf of all the participants, send a very warm welcome to a, a great chef, a great mm -hmm. author, and a good human being. Sir, thank I you, leave sir. the platform to you. So thank you. Other participants, we like to sit and enjoy your uh, thank you sir thank you sir please sir please sir. thank you thank you uh, uh, dr trilok and uh, mr gyan bhushan and all the faculty who is attending this session and all the students you know a very warm welcome and a great good morning to all of you um, you must be wondering that you know why a man wearing a turban is going to talk about kashmiri wazwan food today with you because let me tell you this is my mother's cuisine because i am a kashmiri um, i am a sikh but um, I don't hail from Punjab, and my roots are from Kashmir. So I belong to a district called Baramula. So I've grown up on Kashmiri food uh, because that is my home food. And that is why I thought I will choose this topic because much of the Kashmir food is misunderstood by many of the people. So I would like you to take you through the history. Um, you know, I've visited many countries, um, and um, I'm a graduate from Culinary Institute of America as well. But whenever I did that, uh, uh, Mr. Sunil, I also ma mailed you the presentation, I think, which has come to you. So if you want to play that presentation, it's easier. Uh, but wherever I've gone across the world, I have seen that, you know, how the chefs are so proud um, to offer their own cuisine. And they are, you talk about Italy, for example. When you go to Italy, I mean, people really go to the grandmother's kitchen because the grandmothers are famous for making pastas and different things. People, of course, do visit Michelin star restaurants, but also they're expensive. But people like to go to, you know, the places to have food, uh, to a grandmom's kitchen, to the street foods, to enjoy the culture. So I think when it comes to India and the Indian chefs, 
I somehow feel, and I'm not just generalizing this statement, but very few of us, uh, you know, or, or I would say most of us are not so proud of our own Indian food. You know, we, we ape the Western world. We, we, we promote the Western chefs. Um, we fly them to our country. It, it's great. It's a great idea to learn. But I think just getting influenced by that cuisine and trying to, you know, uh, do the fusion with Indian cuisine to make it look appealing to the Western world, I think that is where we are going slightly wrong. Um, I am not against uh, progressive Indian cuisine, which is like food being done in the uh, degustation menus or presenting it course by course and, you know, doing a great fantabulous job of, you know, presenting the dishes on the plate. But I think somewhere down the line, even when we do that, our ethos, our traditions should not be compromised. The taste of the product. You know, if you look at Chinese food and the Chinese menu, they would clearly put three chilies there if the thing has to be spicy. You know, they would not tone the, the chilies down, but instead they would mention that this is a highly spiced dish with a lot of chilies. But for us, when we see a guest in a restaurant, we automatically start running this in our mind. He, oh, he's a foreigner. Um, he will not like, you know, um, uh, spicy or a hot food. So we already in our mind start toning down the flavors. And we are always ready to do that for the guest because guest is a god for us. But on the other hand, I think it's also important for us to educate the guest because chilies, if world feels that, you know, uh, Indian food is very spicy, then we also, especially as students, you need to understand there's a difference in the food being spicy and the food being hot. Some of the guests will say, I love spicy food. In reality, he doesn't mean that he likes chilies. A spices for him is cinnamon, cardamom, cloves, you know, the flavoring spices. But for us in our mindset, a spicy food means a high chili food. No. So there's a hot food and there's a spicy food. Now, and you can clarify to the guest. He said, would you like to have the food chili hot? And he will say, no, no, no. Tone down on chilies, but spicy is good. So you understand that difference, that spicy necessarily doesn't always mean chilies. Now a dish called Lal Mas from Rajasthan. Now that is made with Nathania chilies. Similar counterpart to Kashmir is Marchwangan Korma. So Marchwangan means the Lal Midge. Now if the entire base, entire body of the dish is the Mirchi, how I'm going to separate the soul out of the dish? If I took chilies out of Lal Mas, it will not be Lal Mas anymore. So we must understand and we must be proud of our cuisine. Um, you know, I was very happy when the Indian Culinary Institute was uh, being formulated. We were part of initial meetings, Chef Gill, myself, uh, many other chefs, and we were discussing about the core uh, curriculum and the modules and everything. I was very excited to have an Indian Culinary Institute, you know. And I think over with the hard work and uh, with documentations and everything, I think we are looking forward for this institute to become the culinary Indian mecca of our country. Um, like Culinary Institute of America has its name. I think Culinary Institute of India will have one day that kind of stature uh, where people who want to learn about Indian cuisine would only come to this institute to learn about Indian cuisine. But I think together we have to make that happen because we are blessed. Because uh, uh, 50 years ago, or even maybe 30 years ago, I would say, choosing a chef profession was not an easy thing to do because we did not know if this was a profession at all. In fact, I grew up with a lot of scare myself, you know, when I was growing up because my parents would tell, you, tell me to study or else they will put me in a hotel to cook food and wash utensils. So it was a very scary thing. And people would look down upon the, and call you names like Bavarchi, Hansama, uh, Bartan Dhoega, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. But you see now in the corona, in the COVID-19, I think the maximum posts that I see on social media are all food related. As if suddenly a lot of chefs have emerged out in the homes and everybody from uncle to auntie to papa to mummy, everybody is trying out new recipes, which is a great thing. And we understand that food is such an integral and an important part of our uh, culture. I think the chefs are the culinary ambassadors. Gone are the times when the chefs were only restricted to a range and cooking. Yes, you are a cook. We are a cook. That's a prime job. But I think apart from that, you need to look at a broader picture. I think we are the culinary ambassadors. We are the ambassadors of our country. Because when we chefs travel mm. abroad, 
we talk about not only food we talk about history we talk about culture we talk about festivals we talk about you know things around food so we are the real ambassadors of our culture of our traditions that we introduce the world to and we must be very proud of our culinary heritage because it is a very very strong heritage and why chef gill myself many other chefs are dwelling down into uh focusing on the lost recipes uh, the a uh, traditional recipe so whenever people ask me is this authentic let me tell you there's nothing authentic because you know the food has always been influenced by cultures uh food has been influenced by by travelers food has been influenced by 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 feedback from the guests so it's on the constant uh, you know um, improvement i would say but yes i think what's important we must understand is the traditional food and why when i make that comment that authentic because you know today when we are going to talk about wazwan and understand the importance of one of the major spice you know like a zafran or saffron now the saffron is completely alien to the entire world the saffron was first grown in greece and from the greece it landed up into our country when the mughal rulers came in the chilies were never a part of our culture it came vasco da gama bought it 600 years ago from a place called chili which is in peru and that's why it's called chili uh you know in south of india you know you see a lot of kadhai which is called china chatti now china means china chatti means a wok so that is the chinese influence the kadhai which we do the stir fry uh because nalanda university was one of the biggest universities and scholars from all across the world used to come and study yun sang who was a big scholar from china actually introduced lot of cooking methodologies to india so like that we are today a melting you know pot of different cultures and we learn from each other and lot of persians the moguls bought in the cuisine and when we talk about wazwan it's a complete different cuisine from a traditional indian cuisine uh, i would say uh, because the methodology applied the cooking principles applied are very persian are very iran uh, based etc and that gives a birth to a new tradition which started in kashmir um so you know i wouldn't like my presentation to be long i would like to answer more questions of students but since it's a very interesting talk, topic about kashmiri wazwan uh, i would definitely like to take you through it uh, uh, for at least 20 minutes and then probably we can have a set of question and answer which i'll be very happy to answer so kashmir is very close to my heart i miss kashmir um and whenever i talk about kashmir uh, i remember the phrase of one of the poets in jahangir's court in the mogul uh, era so jahangir was son of shah jahan and he went and settled in kashmir because he was a man who loved art architect uh, uh, architecture um, he was the man who actually refined the food of kashmir he was the one who introduced things like um, you know the the silk car uh, the silk carving the wood carving and the artistry in kashmir and he was fond of poetry etc so one of his poets amir khusro rightly said he said agar bar ruh e zameen ast hameen asto hameen asto hameen ast now the literal translation of this farsi phrase is agar bar ruh e zameen ast if ever a heaven ruh e zameen ast heaven came down to the earth if ever a heaven came down to the earth hameen asto hameen asto hameen ast it will be here forever here forever here forever so what he said about kashmir was that if there is a paradise on earth here it is here it is here it is and kashmir is really pretty it's far better than switzerland and i've told that to my swiss friends to say that you must come and visit kashmir and uh, you know all the movies in the past were always uh, you know shot in kashmir until the trouble some time happened um now many of us know but when we talk about kashmiri food our mind just goes towards uh, rogan josh the wazwan but let me tell you kashmir is amazing because kashmir is not only kashmir kashmir is jammu and kashmir so kashmir actually has three larger districts the jammu which becomes the summer capital uh, sorry winter capital uh, and all the secretariat and everybody shifts to jammu for six months when it's summers uh, when it's winters <clears throat> and shrinagar is the summer capital so there is jammu there is kashmir and then there is leh and ladakh and if you see you know the state is very unique uh, with all these three regions they have their own different language they have their own different culture they even have their own dressing up sense 
sometimes one wonders if it is just one state or many states combined into one even the food you see the food of jammu is mostly influenced from himachal um there is also a cheese which is available there which is locally had you know grilled on tawa and it's almost like a mozzarella it's called kalhadi so kalhadi kulcha is something very very typical to just uh, just jammu it's not even found in kashmir um the kashmir really starts after you cross the jawhar tunnel when you go into the kashmir everything changes the 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 smell and the air changes the language changes um so you know the jammu cuisine is more like a himachali more like a punjabi cuisine uh, whereas uh, cuisine of kashmir is typical divided into two larger parts of cuisine one is called the kashmiri muslim cuisine and one is called the kashmiri pandit cuisine and the stark difference between both is that you know they both eat meat because in winters for 4 5 months when it's snowing you will not get any vegetables so how are people going to su- uh, survive so survival of the fittest people have chosen to eat meat and non vegetarian but the difference is that the pandits do not use garlic and onion into their cooking whereas the muslim cuisine uses more of garlic and onion into their cooking um and and the food of leh and ladakh is very influenced from china uh, the tibet that border so you see lot of thupka lot of you know uh, uh, things like uh, uh, stews lot of stir fries you know which are a common part in the ladakh cuisine uh, ladakh has some very ayurvedic medicinal kind of food so it is very very different i mean if you look at ladakhi food it cannot be compared to a kashmiri wazwan for example um so jammu region basically is the transition area between the north india plains and the himalayas um and uh, like i said even the language spoken there is very different it's called dogri whereas in kashmir you speak kashmiri and in leh and ladakh you speak ladakhi so that is how basically the difference is kashmir um is a land of valleys and lakes the temperatures in the winters can go up to minus 10 degree celsius and that is where people start getting prepared from october onwards to start drying their vegetables so the combination of sun dried tomatoes sun dried apples um sun dried uh, brinjals you know it's it's something very unique to indian culture uh, kashmiri culture and when we look at you know sun dried tomatoes from italy we must realize that you know thousands of years ago we have learned the art of sun drying the vegetables and pairing up vegetable with the fruit in the cooking so like a very famous dish called soot wangan is made in kashmir which is a stir fried of dried brinjals with apples and you have more than 50 60 varieties of apples that grow in kashmir uh, and it's it's just amazing the kind of fruits that grow in kashmir because when the mughal emperors came and settled down in kashmir from persia they wanted to have the kind of fruits that they enjoyed in their country in persia iran and they were not able to get that food in india because of the climatic conditions and the soil conditions but i think kashmir was one of the places with the soil conditions were very much to the europe and they could grow things like you know apples and apricots and um so all these things like saffron and um uh, cherries and so something really really unique um and 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 they did so for their own reasons because they wanted to enjoy the fruits um, so i'm going to talk to you in this uh, entire slide about the historical background of kashmir which is very important uh then we'll go on to you know uh, its demographic location we'll go into its cuisine we go into its speciality ingredients uh, the utensils used um so all this is also mentioned in my second book uh, the indian cuisine uh, the quantity food production operations and indian cuisine there's a whole chapter on kashmiri food um but yeah i mean a trip to kashmir uh, would always have an unforgettable experience in the minds of those who have been there Uh, located at the foothills of himalayas kashmir is the crown of india kashmir has been an inspiration for the music lovers artists photographers um, even honeymooners you know there was a time when kashmir was just flocked of all these people i still remember as a child an area called bulevard which was right opposite on the dal lake uh, where the obroy palace was situated trust me if in 1985s i'm talking about if you ever ke- uh, came to that part of the land you would think you are somewhere in europe you know very mystical people uh, you know water skiing on dal lake um, uh, full of all foreigners europeans you know um, and i still remember 1980s when the credit card was used in kashmir uh, this i'm talking about 40 45 years ago so it's amazing 
uh, jammu on the other hand is um, uh, very hindu dominated the dogras um, and hindu pilgrims um, as it hosts famous temples like you know mata vishnu devi which is there uh, it's known for its temples of uh, ram temple which is there and jammu has mostly been the stopover zone for tourists on route to kashmir uh, also being the change point for the hot climate to the colder valleys jammu is also a religious transit zone uh, the hindu uh, religion gives way to muslims uh, that predominate the kashmir valley and hindus and sikhs also inhabit kashmir but the maximum population definitely is of muslims and that's why the wazwan is very famous uh, the valley of kashmir has always been the center of attraction because of its natural beauty many poets have called it paradise on earth and one has to go there to really believe it uh, the mogul rulers added to the beauty of kashmir by creating some of the wonderful landscape gardens like nishad shalamar gardens etc which are even preserved till today and you can easily see the mogul architecture alive there the british also added their unique touch to this place by adding the house boats uh, to the dal lake you know and uh, the house boats are made out of a special wood called deodar which is the local wood of kashmir and look at the beauty you know of this nature that god has given that kind of wood which does not destroy in water in fact becomes better in water and that is the reason only deodar wood is used for crafting out the house boats imagine a wooden house boat standing for hundreds of years on the waters by this time any wood would just disintegrate but this deodar wood actually becomes stronger and stronger and more beautiful by being submerged in the water so i think that is something that most of you did not know today and that's a learning that our house boats are made out of deodar wood uh, which is typical of uh, uh, kashmir and dar is a chinese uh, is a persian word for wood so dio is the name dio wood is dio dar and that is why we call cinnamon as dar el chini that was the name dar el chini meant wood of china a persian word which today we known as dalchini you know so that is how the language and the knowledge is important for you uh, to understand few things that how does the names emerge out of things uh, ladakh on the other hand lies uh, north of kashmir borders the tibet the clear influence of tibet on ladakhi culture has earned its little name it's also known by little tibet uh, the momos and everything are very common in ladakh the barren landscape landscape of ladakh with high himalayan barrier prevents the clouds of rain to climb across and hence sky is always very nice clear and blue uh, ladakh is many times also known as the moon land because of clear skies and shining moon so very mesmerizing uh, that is basically the three areas of jammu and kashmir uh, jammu lies in the northern plains kashmir is on the foot of mighty himalayas and uh, um, you know the himalayan the himalayas separate the valley of kashmir from the zanskar valley and the zanskar valley is one which separates from ladakh by the range called as zanskar range um, many of you would have heard about lord of leh ladakh especially after that movie three idiots and now with the chinese attack happening on the pangong lake etc the southwest of the kashmir valley is bounded uh, by the range called the peer panjal range at one point in time kashmir just like kathmandu was the lake that got drained out many years ago so there is a little mythology you know why it is called as kashmir uh, people believe that you know there was a big lake it was called sati sar so sar again is a uh, sanskrit word for lake that's why amrit sar so sar means a lake or a water body and sati sar uh, was a big lake and there used to live a demon his name was jolod baba so this demon used to live in the water the demon used to come out the people's houses were on the mountain tops he would torment those people loot them kill them and then go back into the water so people were really terrified of uh, jolod baba demon so they went to rishi kashyap who was there in kashmir meditating and they asked for his help so the mythology says that you know rishi kashyap with a big blow with his hand he hit the mountain and the mountain cracked open and the lake got drained and when the lake got drained uh, the demon emerged and people everybody killed him so that is how today the land of kashmir is born by the name kashyap shamir means kashyap killed so the kashyap shamir became kashmir over a period of time and that is a little mythology i don't know how far it is true but lot of scientists um, and the archaeologists have confirmed 
that you know a part of the kashmir that time was a water body it was probably a kind of a sea that had got drained out with the tectonic shift in plates um so that is what today kashmir is it's a land of beautiful valley uh, it's unlike any, any other hill station you know if you go to Hima uh, if you go to shimla manali you know typical of any of the uh, uh, hill stations you have a mall road and then you have houses on the hills kashmir is not like that kashmir is a valley it's plain roads you know it's plain roads landscapes with the mountains on the side and you know you can drive you can ride um, you can cycle around so it is it is not something that you have to keep climbing mountains it's also a very plain road um the temperatures in jammu region like delhi can be as hot and humid as 48 degrees celsius whereas winters in shrinagar can go up to minus 10 degrees celsius and at the same time temperatures in the area of dras and kargil which are towards the leh and ladakh region can go up to minus 50 degrees celsius one of the coldest places in the world after siberia um so when the climate becomes so cold the nature has its own way of growing different kind of vegetables different kind of fruits you know which people can eat and survive on and the classical example is the kashmiri rice so the kashmiri rice when it grows in the colder climate it develops a starch around it because by nature that grain has to protect itself from the harsh climate now that rice is very starchy it's almost like risotto so there's a style of cooking kashmiri rice you know traditionally we cook the kashmiri rice by boiling it in lot of water and then draining it off and after draining then you would put on wood charcoal to fluff up otherwise kashmiri rice made in pressure cooker or somewhere will become almost like a risotto or like a khichdi and that is why the famous you know rajma from kashmir or area called jammu is very nice because of the starch content in that rajma so in fact rajma is not a kashmiri cuisine rajma is mostly a jammu cuisine and um, especially a region called badrawa which is in jammu and but it's called as kashmiri rajma some people do call it jammu ke rajma but yeah the rajma actually belongs to jammu and it has come through pandit cuisine in kashmir as well and it is not just cooked like a rajma it is always paired up with turnips uh, called gokchi um, so rajma gokchi is a very traditional kashmiri dish uh, unlike in jammu they don't put gokchi and they make rajma just like a like a punjabi rajma uh, you know so that is basically the three regions um, and uh, if we if we look at the historical background i think kashmir has seen lot of influences you know the the first religion that was popularized in kashmir was buddhism and uh, the islam arrived in the 14th century and uh, you know when akbar uh, the mogul ruler in the 14th century uh, started conquering india uh, that was the changing face in the history of kashmir historians say that buddhism was the first religion practiced in kashmir but by 7th century onward it started getting dominated also by the hinduism and uh, though they let the buddhism also flourish under their rule and that is why then they moved to leh and ladakh but as the time passed on most of the people uh, embraced islam after the mogul rulers started to occupy the kashmir because they levied heavy taxes and they wanted people to get converted into uh, you know islam and that is where the sikh religion comes in when the kashmiri pandits were asked to embrace islam and they went to guru uh, teg bahadur who was the ninth guru Uh, at that time father of guru gobind singh our 10th guru and the kashmiri pandits went up to guru teg bahadur and said save us uh, that aurangzeb wants us all to convert into islam so guru teg bahadur said okay go and tell him if he can convert me into islam you all will get converted into islam aurangzeb was very happy he said i have to just convert one man and then everybody else would get converted so he bought uh, uh, you know guru teg bahadur all the way from patna to delhi where he tormented him and you know Guru Tegh Bahadur sacrificed his life uh, for the Kashmiri Pandits and for Kashmir, and in reverence, each of the Kashmiri Pandits converted their elder son or the second son into a Sikh, and that is how the Sikhism actually became very popular again in Kashmir. So a lot of people feel that you know most of the Sikhs have come from Pakistan during the partition. Uh, no, the Sikh community stayed much before that, even in the 1800s, uh, 17 and after 1750, 1800 beginning. Maharaja Ranjit Singh ruled the Jammu and Kashmir belt uh, for a very long time and Maharaja Ranjit Singh was the one who actually popularized or reinstilled the agricultural farming of saffron 
uh, into our country. And during that uh, re- uh, time, the saffron got its real importance. So then after, you know, he, he had a very uh, famous or a, you know, very strong, uh, uh, his wazir, uh, his second in command, uh, Mr. Gulab Singh. So Ranjit Singh handed over the reins of Jammu and Kashmir to Gulab Singh, who was a Dogra. So that is how the Dogras came into uh, thing and they ruled Kashmir for, you know, a long time. And that is when they developed a lot of, uh, you know, also different kind of cuisines, etc. Uh, and then uh, the Rajma came into uh, Kashmir area and all that happened during the Dogra times. And uh, Maharaja Hari Singh, uh, you know, uh, in the recent times, we know his son uh, uh, also went as an ambassador, Mr. Karan Singh. He went as an ambassador to U.S. around 20 years ago. Uh, so Hari Singh is fairly new because how we know because one of his properties, Obroy Palace, was taken over by Obroy Hotels for a 99-year lease. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, as you know, that there's an Article 370, so people can't go and buy land there, which has now been lifted. So now it is a free thing that people can go and acquire land, etc. Um, but all this has happened, and suddenly the corona thing has happened. So a lot of things, but let's see. Things are looking good. Okay, so... Um, so with the Mughal architecture, with the Mughals thing coming in, I think that improved really the kind of food that Kashmir is when we talk about the Wazwan cuisine. And, uh, you know, if we go the slides ahead. Okay, so the seasonal availability um, of things, like I told you that Valley of Kashmir is very famous for its vegetables and fruits. And the valley produces fruits on seasonal basis. Uh, the warm months of May, June, July bring around many kinds of cherries, peaches, apricots. August and September bears various kinds of pears, few varieties of apples. October and November come all almonds, walnuts, uh, more apples. Um, the fruits form an integral part of the diet of the people here. The fruits are preserved by canning, pickling, and also used in many dishes as the famous kormas where the plums are used, you know, like a alu bukhara korma. Um, almonds are used both in raw and green form as well, and the ripe variety. Apples include sweet and tart varieties, and the red and yellow crab apples, you know, the small, tiny apples. They're very perishable, and you don't see them in the local market. Many of the fruit from Kashmir is actually exported out of the country. Uh, there are famous varieties of cherries, which includes the, you know, the nadra cherries, the wild cherries, um, the sar cherries, which Germans have always used in their black forest cakes. Uh, grapes are dried and used in raisins and many rice pilafs. Uh, plums are found in abundance. They are known as alu bukhara. Not to be confused with khobani, which is apricot. Uh, rubab, you know, which we read in the Western cuisine. It's an integral part of uh, Kashmir. The wild asparagus grows in Kashmir. Hops grow in Kashmir. You know, that thing which is used for making beer. Uh, water chestnuts called the singhara or the golu. You know, they are harvested in the Wooler Lake. Uh, eaten as snacks. Uh, a blood red variety of pomegranate is also found here called as Kabuli Anar. Probably it came from Afghanistan. Um, the seeds also are dried and, you know, used as Anardana, which is a saring agent. Uh, many vegetables, especially ones from the Dal Lake, are very popular in Kashmir. Like, you know, there's a <clears throat> radish which is absolutely this big and round. It's called the Dal Gokchi. Then you also have Nadru, which is as old as 5,000 years ago. Uh, in our country. So these are the stem of lotus root, a very integral part of the Kashmiri Pandit cuisine. And, uh, you know, and Kashmiris are mostly rice eaters. People eat chapati only when they are on a medical diet by doctors to say you're a diabetic patient, so you should not consume more of rice. But otherwise, for Kashmiris, rice is the most integral thing. The breakfast comprises of breads, which are made in local shops around village, so people don't make the regular breads at home. They always buy it, whether fresh. Uh, sometimes, you know, breads can last you for a couple of days. But, but breads like lavash, uh, lavash it's called, uh, we, we normally drink, you know, when we get up early morning, we drink kahwa, uh, which is special tea leaves and which are brewed with cardamom and saffron. And it is always had sweet and without milk because early morning when you get up, you need that sweetness as energy. Uh, and it's rich in antioxidants. So kava is the early morning betty, 
and then for the breakfast normally people you know have a namkeen chai so this is also special tea leaves and the tea after making becomes pink in color and it's never had with sugar so you add little salt and it's a salty pink chai it's also called noon chai or sheer chai and traditionally you would see large glasses of sheer chai and people break these breads and soak into this and then they eat it with the spoon that's a normal breakfast because people have an early lunch like 11 o'clock so that is where you have rice you have hark so hark is like a sag like a green leafy vegetables and there are different very typical kind of sags which we are also going to discuss the concept of tandoor is not at home you know the tandoors are always very different kind of tandoors which is you know two or three in a village area um and you will see even in delhi wherever you will have kashmiri immigrants come in somewhere down the line they will hunt a kashmiri baker who is making the kashmiri breads you know because for a kashmiri not having that kashmiri bread is a complete no no i mean they have to have it it's an integral part of our culture okay so we go on to special equipments on the next slide so kashmir as the cuisine it's unique in itself and also some of the very special equipments are used in preparation of the meals kashmiri cooking uses pots that have narrow neck to trap all the aromas of the fragrant spices so if you see there uh, on top there's a degchi which is like this shape so you know when the flavoring spices are rising up it it condenses and falls back there uh, entrapping the all the flavors there uh, and since most of the food is finished on dam it becomes essential to use the narrow neck vessels and though all these vessels are referred to as deg or leji or even degul but you can use interchangeably so some of the things uh, you know shown here of course there's a chula cooking which is very very common in kashmir and uh, so you see the deg there you see another ve uh, vessel called the tarami and uh, you will see another equipment there called gosht pare kain this is uh, 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 this is a uh, round stone block and there is a wooden hammer you know so this wooden hammer you use for beating the meat that preparation is called goshtaba and it's a very very typical of the wazwan cuisine uh, there are some other utensils which are listed here uh, the typical ladles and the one that you see has come from russia and it's called samovar so samovar is something in which you make tea in kashmir so when when the woman of the you know woman of the home they carry there on their head towards fields where the husbands are working they make their tea pour the tea in that and you know there's a char place for charcoal and uh, that is how they you know uh, make it wait i have a samovar at home let me bring it i'll just show it to you how it looks like give me a minute you know so that is the one of the beauties of taking class from home because you can show can you see this so that is the samovar and it has two parts essentially you see there is a thing here where the charcoal goes in and here you put water and then you close it so also the charcoal can be put from here so this charcoal as a pipe gets heated up you see this this pipe gets heated up and the water around it kind of simmers and brews and then you have tea in that tea milk sugar everything and this the ladies carry on their heads and the tea is ready and you can keep pouring more water and you get a constant tea so this is called samovar it's a very very typical equipment of kashmir i think uh, uh, just i uh, uh, you know uh, uh, chef uh, bali yes it's interesting to see that you know it's it's a live sort of a demonstration what you are doing <laughs> Uh, you know, I, this reminds me of uh, one of our unfinished tasks yes. uh, of um, uh, having a, a cuisine or a culinary museum. Museum, yes. Yes. So I, uh, you know, would love to engage with you, uh, sure, to, uh, and also Chef Gill also, so that yes. at two places, both the Tirupati and the Noida Center, 
we have this uh, some time maybe let us yeah. hope that it it uh, gets over and yeah. we will definitely touch bit with with you on this Thank yeah you. i mean whenever i go to kashmir now when i become a professional chef and i go to people you know they are they are they are throwing away their old utensils and all and i you know have managed to collect few of the old utensils you know so my mother had my grandmother's pot which is almost 200 years old pot because oh. it was handed over from generation to generation That's so i still make damalu and you know things in that so the, you know these old utensils i'm sure that many of you students must have had old utensils at home please don't throw them let's all collect it and let's yes. all as a country as a nation build towards culinary museums mm-hmm. uh, for our colleges and yes. there's no better place than ICI ICI so i'm i'm with you yeah. sir definitely on this one thank you thank yeah. you very much please please continue i just so, uh, uh, sorry kashmir, for interruption I'm no sorry. no no problem so kashmiri yeah. when we talk about you know a difference again in a pandit cuisine and a wazwan so when we talk about wazwan typically and i'm going to talk about wazwan today is uh, a, a food of uh, muslims okay it's a muslim uh, cuisine the waza means a chef and wan means a fair and this is really a typical thing which takes you know at least 10 to 12 hours of preparation because the food is not made on gas ranges it is made on timber wood um it is made on chulas and it is made through the night so the the wazas work through the night and there's a whole typical thing because you need to prepare at least 36 non veg items in a wazwan and wazwan is typically done only on weddings so it is not an everyday affair that you would cook wazwan at home and uh, the way to serve it also is that you know uh, you serve the food on a tarami which is like a big plate where you put the mound of rice and then you distribute meat accordingly to different people so four people sit on a tarami to eat wazwan and then you have you know something called as tashtnar which is passed around so tashtnar is like a little surahi in which you put uh, you know rose flavored water and then you pass it around um, to people to wash their hands so they wash their hands and then the 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 things begin so we don't in kashmir have you know different courses like kebabs and everything is served on the same plate so there'll be a curry there's a dry thing coming up there's a sheikh kebab coming up there's a tabak mas coming up so a lot of things just come on the plate itself and they are very conscious because you know 36 non veg items it is not also possible for people to eat so in many weddings you also would give a small plastic packets to each people so whatever they can't eat in the meat they can pack it in their pieces and take a doggy bag home and not waste it so that is again you know very sustainable uh, very environmental friendly and that is the typical of kashmir thing um all right so we can go to the next slide so let's talk about some special ingredients you know which are again very typical of kashmir because every cuisine has its own unique ingredients uh like i said climate of Kandu- kashmir is very very conducive for growing varieties of fruits and vegetables um that are used in daily food uh in the people of this land due to unavailability of land available for agriculture kashmiris have shifted to cultivating vegetables on floating gardens or lakes so dal lake you have a floating garden you know where all the vegetables etc grow in dal lake and uh, you know people here believe that vegetables cultivated in this manner and the manure which is used gives the best flavor that one can get the vegetables from dal lake are the most sought after and the taste of the same is also very very different so one of the unique ingredients if you can go to the next slide is very typical to kashmir especially of the pandit cuisine is called the lotus stem or the nadru very popular vegetable used in kashmir it is usually paired up with the spinach the spinach of kashmir is very different it has got the tapering leaves like chinar ke patte and uh, you know it's like an arrow shape and has got a very very different flavor um yeah so that is the nadru there that you can see and then you have shallots which are called pran very expensive here in kashmir this is very closely related to the french shallots so the onions that we have in kashmir are called the pran um and they are very very different in flavor like the shallots have the flavor of both onion and garlic um and even in kashmir you would fetch a price of at least 350 to 400 rupees a kilo uh, you know for this uh, shallots so now of course people have started using onion because also growing this is difficult and, and it's expensive see a lot of dried vegetable that you see is called shingri so kashmir use lot of uh, dried vegetables uh, coming august september they start drying loki brinjals apples tomatoes 
because in the winters they would have to use all this uh, you know because there will be no uh, vegetables now the another new ingredient you will see there which many of you won't have heard is called kachnar ki kali so kachnar is the flower from the bahunia flowers bahunia is the english name and these are edible flowers of the bahunia tree which is commonly used in the cuisine it's commonly used for also making raitas the flower is first boiled and then the green outer stem is removed uh, and then it is used um, if you don't cook it very properly it can become very bitter then next slide there's an ingredient called mowal your mowal you must have seen it's also called coxcomb flower and mowal is the one which is actually used as the coloring agent uh, to give a red color so a lot of people when they talk about ratan jot um you know it is not something that is used in cooking a lot of people make rogan josh with ratan jot ratan jot is carcinogenic in nature so it is also only used for dyeing clothes etc in kashmir so you would hardly see ratan jot actually being used in the in the cooking on the other hand it is mowal which is more organic it's a natural flower uh, it's a velvety kind of flower it's dried in sun and then boiled in water you get a blood red colored water which is used for cooking damalu and rogan josh and other stuff saffron what you see is the dried stigma of a flower called the crocus flower one of the world's costliest herb we can get uh, this at almost you know the price um, like 40 to 45000 rupees a kilo it comes in a region called uh, pampor um, in kashmir uh, it comes from a purple kind of a flower uh, and you get three stigmas so it's very expensive because of its harvesting and also the quantity that grows on one flower um then morels or the gucci you know it's very integral part of kashmir that you see there again around 40 to 45000 rupees a kilo they are expensive because there is no seed for gucci the gucci's just are available wild especially after storms and you know rainy seasons and as kids i remember you know we used to go foraging in the in the in the orchids to hunt for morels after a, a lightning thunder and storm and our elders always used to tell us that you know uh, when the lightning strikes the ground a morel is born so when there was a lot of lightning we were very excited going and foraging morels but now as i grow up and study and research i find out that you know it is not the lightning that strikes the ground but morels are already growing there but with lot of storm and lightning and air wind blowing the leaves blow out exposing the morels but as kids we were very happy to believe that i found a morel and the lightning has struck here and you know it was a great thing we all used to walk with little baskets in our hand uh, going all over the place hunting for morels um the another one that you see there is called the kol rabi also known as gant gobi also known as monja hak in kashmir is very typical again of the wazwan uh, cuisine but also kashmiri pandit cuisine you know so it is made in different forms one is just whitish in color you know you just slice them there's a typical way of slicing you use the leaf and the root both uh it's also called nol khol um and it's a vegetable i think which came from germany into our country uh next slide uh, we'll see a lot of leaves called the hark okay sorry so that hark is not mentioned there so there are various types of hark that grow in kashmir like a monja hark like a vasta hark like a kadam hark so there are different kind of leaves that grow in kashmir and for a kashmiri you know even if he has non veg or not but hark is very important so rice can just be eaten with little hark um and then there are typical garam masala which is called the wear masala which is very very typical of kashmir again and there's another black lentils that grow in kashmir which are called the vermouth so the vermouth are almost like the brazilian black beans and there's a lentil preparation made from that so i'll just talk about some famous dishes that are also made in the kashmiri wazwan cuisine and like i already discussed that even pandits eat you know a uh, lot of non veg but uh, they don't use uh, you know they don't use uh, onion or garlic so the first thing that you see here is uh, rishta um, it's a very famous dish from kashmir the rishta and goshtaba are made together the word goshtaba means the gosht and the aag the meat and the water so it's very very typical of kashmir there are no chilies in this a little bit of black pepper you use but the meat is pounded for many hours and this meat is a fresh meat you can't have a cold meat from fridge and this cannot be made in any of the robocoops mixies blenders no we've tried everything but the technique is to mash uh, with a wooden 
nollet which is actually made out of uh, chinar wood or walnut wood because these two woods don't splinter up when you when you beat it uh, so you put the meat on the stone and you beat it with the hammer so the meat ruptures you know the fibers from the meat they get flattened out so this is the way it gets almost like a sausage consistency uh so then the dumplings of this are poached in yogurt which is flavored with somph so somph powder is typically very very typical of wazwan of kashmiri cuisine and also special kind of chilies you know in kashmir many of the spices don't grow they come from kerala south everywhere else but it is this chili which kashmiris are very proud of that this is one spice which grows abundantly in kashmir and the beauty of this kashmiri chili is that it's not spicy but it's very dark red in color so that's why most of the kashmiri dishes you'll find the very bright red in color like rogan josh etc so rishta is usually cooked in a chili based uh, gravy and the gustaba is cooked in the yogurt based plain gravy without any chilies um so apart from gustaba you also have dishes like dhaniwal korma sorry i can't read on this this is yeah so that is dhaniwal korma so the dhaniwal korma basically is the lamb which is paired with the uh, uh, fresh coriander and also coriander seeds it's a rich preparation of lamb in a yogurt based gravy but the meat is again taken from the leg of the lamb the beauty of kashmiri wazwan is that no part of the lamb is wasted right from the head to the toe all different parts are used for different types of preparations um so mostly the leg part is used for gustaba uh, different curries uh, the breast part of the lamb is taken off and cooked for tabak mas uh, the ribs etc along with meat pieces are used for um, you know making yakhni and curries so tabak mas is again if you look even look at the words you know these words are very persian so tabak mas tabak again means the saddle uh, and uh, you know it's a very unique preparation where the ribs of the spare ribs of the lamb are boiled in water and milk with spices for at least 2 to 3 hours until the meat just you know falls off the bone and even the cartilages bone gets soft and after that they're chilled they're cut into pieces and they're pan fried in ghee until they become crisp so it's it's eaten like a kebab uh, so that is tabak mas and lot of kashmiri pandits also make a batter of rice and flour besan and dip this tabak mas after cooking and fry it that is called as kabarga so from one dish you can make two dishes tabak mas and kabarga but the unique thing is boiling it with spices for many hours and it be really succulent etc um many more dishes in the wazwan like aap gosht um uh, okay so that's kabarga the methi mas again is very typical it is made from you know the 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 stomach lining of the sheep uh, it is made from the esophagus uh, which is the food pipe that goes in and also from small pieces of boti lamb so all these three are paired with fresh methi little palak and also kasuri methi it's a it's a dry kind of a preparation it is again usually eaten with naan or with kebabs and in the weddings in the morning breakfast it's also served with slices of bread so this is typical methi mas um then uh, so that's yakhni so the yakhni very different from indian avdi yakhni uh for many of us the avdi yakhni is like a stock lamb stock but yakhni in kashmir is a dish it's a yogurt based gravy almost like the gravy of gustaba and in this you put uh, pieces of meat uh again the leg pieces the 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 rib cases etc and yakhni is very very popular in kashmir so you can make yakhni out of actually uh, lamb chicken you can also make vegetable yeah, yakhni like al yakhni made with pumpkins you can also make yakhni with uh uh nadru called the nadru yakhni so this is very very typical of kashmir and then you have rogan josh which again came from persia into our country and the two words rogan and josh the rogan means the fat or the oil that surfaces on the top and the josh actually is the strong is the fla- is the is the fire okay so the fire actually is called the josh in persian so this is the dish which is made with chilies uh with the uh, mustard oil and it's very very unique to kashmir the rogan josh is also col- colored with mobile uh, with the coxcomb uh, leaves and then you have many other you know uh, vegetarian dishes called ravangan chaman 
you know, which are the vegetarian pandit cuisine kind of a thing, uh, like Kashmiri dam alu, you know, also known as Kashmiri dam olav, um, like methi chaman, you know, like uh, cottage cheese made with fenugreek, etc. So this is largely you will find because, you know, in Kashmir, when you have weddings, you also have a lot of vegetarian pandit friends, you know, who wouldn't eat the kind of meat that is uh, slaughtered in the Muslim style. So, you know, they also, or, or there are people who are vegetarian. So for them, vegetarian dishes also have to be prepared. Uh, that is some two of the hawks that are there on that thing for you. So one is the normal hawk, also called as kadam hawk. And this is the sonchal or the Kashmiri wild spinach. Next slide. Yeah, so these are the Kashmiri pandit dishes. Ravangan saman is big, thick pieces of cottage cheese, which is cooked in tomatoes. Uh, Kashmiri damalu, again, is very typical. It's like a goshtaba for vegetarians. You know, it is not just aloo. Uh, it is the larger pieces of aloo, which have been boiled, prigged with toothpick, and deep fried for almost two to three hours until they become light. And then they are stewed in a gravy and cooked on dam. So it's one of the very unique, very, very time-consuming process. And again, alu, if you must see that, you know, alu was something that was bought in by the Portuguese. And that time, the alu was considered to be royalty. So only the kings would cook the potatoes uh, because it was so expensive. And, uh, you know, when Nawab Wajid Ali Shah went to Calcutta to bring his gaddi back from the British, he started making his biryani with <coughs> lamb and potatoes. So many of you know, the chefs growing up now think that, oh, Wajid Ali Shah become very, became very poor. And as a result, he had to mix potatoes into his biryani, you know, with the lamb. But the thing was that, you know, that time Wajid Ali Shah to make a statement, put the potatoes in the biryani to say that I'm still rich. So what if the British government has taken my empire, I can still afford potatoes in my biryani. So that is how the Calcutta biryani today has got popular with potatoes inside. Because that today, nobody you know, cares too much for potatoes. But potatoes in the 1800s was one of the most expensive dishes, more expensive than the lamb. So there is much to study about Kashmiri wazwan, and I don't want to take a lot of time uh, discussing more. I'm happy to answer more questions. If I'm unable to answer questions, if there is a paucity of time, then I would ask all of you students, you can follow me on my Instagram, Chef Bali is my handle, the man holding two cycles in the hand. So, and if you write me a question there, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, so, thank you so much, and I'm ready for any questions that are coming my way. Thank you, Chef. Uh, I would like to inform you that uh, the students from both the centers are from all over India. Yeah. And uh, we, we are at uh, different, different location. You are in uh, Kashmir, mm -hmm. and you took us to the gastronomic tour of Kashmir and particularly to Aswan. So before starting question answer session, I would like to request uh, Tulok sir, Dr. Tulok Charnika sir, to uh, sum up this session and then we will start question answer session. Thank you, thank you, Chef. It was a very good learning. Uh, why I'm mentioning it is a very good learning. Uh, two days before I have read the book where you have written Kashmiri Cuisine and Aswan. Mm. Uh, some of the thing, even after reading, I could not understand. Mm -hmm. But our director, sir, was mentioning through one of my WhatsApp messages to look, arrange a webinar where students and faculty cannot understand, which will make them to understand through webinar. It is completely true today, Chef. Uh, what you. I didn't understand through the literature, I could understand directly. You are addressing on that. Thank and you. Uh, 1045, you are a little apprehensive about your audio system. Uh -huh. Whether the audio will be all right, but the audio system got adjusted because it's very important lecture to everybody. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and as uh, Dr. Lupte pointed out that, uh, starting from history, how that uh, this one, saffron came, how the chili came to existence. Yeah. How yeah. the chinna kadai, which I also learned from you, that South India. From yeah. China, China. And the history and geography of uh, complete Kashmir and uh, showing that uh, equipment to all of us. And that also has given some sort of uh, thinking power that we should collect these type of uh, equipments to our culinary museum, where you promised that you will also help us in body it. Thank you very yes. much. And really, it was a very good uh, learning. Uh, Thank you. I understand that students might have benefited because of your lecture. And only yeah, my you. and prayer 
the presence of a director that yes we should be able to organize a nice demo on a wasma both in yes. a, as well that as that would be great noida sir so that we will have a live demonstration that also as uh, sir always mention about it we will can document it and we can put it in our website also that will be useful to the uh, common people also common audience also so with sure. all the things again i on behalf of entire uh, organizing committee on behalf of director i would like to extend a sincere thanks to your chefs so thank you very much for having accepted it we will all wish you a wonderful uh, afternoon evening and thank god you. bless you sir thank you sir thank you so much oh no, thank no. you Yes, yes. Th thank you, Dr. Lok Chandra. Uh, now we'll start question and answer session. First question is from Mr. Parth Bhatnagar. He is a student of ICI Noida. He is asking which Kashmiri cuisine dishes would you recommend for taste? Uh, chef, unmute yourself. Uh, you are. Uh, Sorry, yeah. yeah. So I think Please. the uh, typicals of Wazwan. When we talk about non-veg items, uh, definitely a Kashmiri sheikh kebab, tabak mas. Uh, then you should taste rogan josh, the goshtaba, rishta. You should taste the yakhni, which is very typical of Kashmir. And then in the vegetarian sections, you must taste uh, uh, the the damalu, the Kashmiri rawangan saman, methi saman, uh, and the typical Kashmiri rajma gogchi. So these are absolutely very must-try dishes for Kashmiri cuisine. Thank you, Chef. Uh, next question comes from our passed out student. He is a chef yeah. in ITC, yeah. uh, uh, Sonar Bangla. Uh, yeah. He is asking, chef, chef, what is difference between shallots from Kashmir and the ones used in South? Oh, very different. The shallots in Kashmir are actually longer and broad and thick. They're long. They're like French shallots. So the the one that we use in um, you know the south of India small are not shallots really they're small onions uh, they're often called as shallots but they're not real shallots the the French shallots are exactly the one that you get in Kashmir so this is long this is golden in color and this is uh, you know like a like a tapering and very different flavor it has a flavor of onion and garlic. Thank you, Chef. Uh, next question is from Miss Jessie, student of ICI Tirupati. She is asking, Chef, what is difference between tarami and mandi? Where are uh, they originated from? So, taram, both are originated from Persia, Iran. Uh, the tarami is a plate. The mandi basically is, you know, uh, it, it's not found in Kashmir. It's very Arabic, uh, very Turkish, very Persian. Where you have a spread of uh, you know rice and then you arrange meat on various types of meat on top, and it's again shared between two three people. But the tarami basically just means the plate. Mandi is a dish by itself, but uh, not 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 made in Kashmir as well. It's very typical Persian, Turkish, Iran. Thank you, Chef. Next question is from Saurabh Mishra. Uh, sir, can you please? Tell some of the fish dishes from Kashmir and rice dishes like pulao. Yeah, so there are a lot of actually Kashmiri fish which is there. Uh, usually the fish that is found in the Jhelum River. So we usually have river fish and trout is one of the most important uh, integral part of the Kashmiri cuisine. So again, uh, trout is mostly prepared in a tomato-based gravy. So it's called Ravangan Gard. And you also make, uh, you know, a, a, a dry kind of a fish with the uh, different vegetables like mooli uh, you know you you pair it with radish you also have hog mixed in so that is again very common uh, sometimes even the very small fish are dried you know the dried fishes are again very commonly stir fried and eaten in kashmir so that is again a part of the kashmiri cuisine but rarely you would see a fish yakni because again people are of this mindset that you know the fish should not be cooked with yogurt so that is very popular. You wouldn't see any dish cooked with yogurt as such in Kashmir. And uh, with the rice, etc. So yeah, so most of the rice preparation, like we have a pulao called the siun pulao, which is almost yeah, like lamb stock, little saffron. And uh, there aren't any biryanis in Kashmir. Uh, but guchi pulao is again very, very typical. Guchi matar pulao, uh, zafrani pulao, 
there is nothing called kashmiri pulao where you know i have seen people put cherries and dried raisins and dry fruits there is nothing like that that exists in kashmir there is nothing called kashmiri pulao we don't make it in kashmir it is usually just the plain rice that is eaten but if you have to make a pulao kind of a thing for special thing then it's just vegetables uh, mixed inside the pulao with little almonds maybe yeah okay thank you chef next question is from mr mrtunjay kumar he is mm-hmm. asking are there any other cuisine or local cuisine than wazwan in kashmir well there are uh, i mean the the typical you know if you go on the street food uh, side near the dal lake and all you will see people roasting little tikkas so all this barbecue kind of meats are called tuj so you can have various kinds of tuj you can have a chicken tuj or a lamb mast tuj and even uh, you know so the basically these are like brochets which are being cooked uh, you know on 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 live so that is the kind of street food um but i think apart from wazwan there is a kashmiri pandit cuisine but there is also kashmir of jammu like i said kalhadi kulcha so yeah there is lot of blend of stuff all across jammu and kashmir thank you chef uh, there is one participant he is saying thoroughly enjoyed your session chef thank uh, you he is asking question can you elaborate on var masala v e r var masala what are yeah. the spices used in it so var masala basically is also called the kashmiri tikki you can say it's like a kashmiri garam masala but it's you know it's a typical way of making it it has shallots it has garlic uh it has red chilies um it has flavoring like you know a cinnamon cardamom cloves so all this is uh, soaked in water and then ground into a paste and after grinding into a thick paste you shape it like small tikkis and you leave it to sun dry people also stitch it on threads and you know sun dry it once dried it's packed up and and sold so there are different different recipes for a var masala for pandit cuisine and a var masala for it's also called vadi masala but pronounced as var uh, v e r some people call it v e r i like a vadi masala but it's not like a vadi it's not like a amritsari vadi or something so that is our typical var masala it is just broken into pieces and added into the gravy thank you chef you also get it ready made actually from different uh, shops okay thank you chef Uh, okay next question coming from mr devans jaiswal uh, he is asking since the cooking techniques and the time of cooking kashmiri food is long isn't yeah. the nutritional quality affected no it is actually not affected because um, all the kashmiri food is cooked on dam so you actually seal the pots with atta dough and cook on a very very slow simmering charcoal so as a result there is nothing escaping out you know if you're cooking food with you know open lids and everything then i understand so it's almost like a sous vide cooking where everything is trapped under a lid and everything stays there so yeah it it it, it is very nutritious and a slow cooking on a slow flame uh by you know covering the deg or a pot uh makes the meat come very tender very succulent so kashmiris don't like the meat which is which has bite into it kashmiris like the meat which is very soft very tender and very flavorful thank you chef uh, next question is from mr satyakirti a uh, fifth semester student of icci tirupati he is asking at the start of the session you spoke about how we modify indian dishes to meet guest preferences where would you draw the line between being open to modifying dishes for guests while not losing authenticity of the dish how much can we modify a dish so that it still matches what the guest want uh, but its authenticity is not lost so i i think somewhere down the line we as chefs it's very important for us to educate the guest uh, politely you know if people know what they're eating uh, then they would want that and especially that's what happens you know when you have something regular on your menu you will see that lot of the guests have choices that they want this to be done in a particular manner but when it comes to any food promotions when the guests come they are looking forward not to a tradition uh, not to a conventional dish but they are coming to explore the traditional dish how the khansa must make it and then they are very open to try it i think we should have more of these culinary promotion uh, it's a great way to educate the guest and then of course it's guest choice you know if the guest knows that you know this particular thing is made like that for example you know i know a guest who operates his business from italy for 6 months in a year 
and this i'm talking about a story 20 years ago when the guest came to me and said chef can you make me a pasta spaghetti with tomato ketchup and little butter i got very offended and i wanted to educate him on you know the pasta and the napolitan and the al dente and the guest made me sit there and told me about his visits in italy and he named pasta that i hadn't heard of and i'm talking this 30 years ago in my career 25 years ago in my career it really opened my eyes you know when the guest said that this is what i eat 6 months in italy but this is what my grandmother used to make it was an overcooked spaghetti with tomato ketchup and butter am i asking for too much so that is a clear thing you know when the guest wants something specific you please go ahead and satisfy his needs because the guy knew what al dente was the guy knew what real pasta was but this is what he wanted because that is what his taste buds are then in that case i don't think we as chefs can do too much but i think it's our responsibility to educate the guest and tell them that this is how traditionally it is made and served should you wish to have it like that i'm happy to offer it to you but this is what the tradition thing is so please have this portion and and see how it is because maybe the guest has had it somewhere else and it was very different so give guest what he wants at the same time give him a tasting portion of the authentic traditional that you have made and ask him to taste maybe you will convert few guests maybe you will educate few guests and say are yaar ye to bahut mast hai ab se aise hi khayenge hum so it's a slow change we can only make this change slowly we cannot make it overnight thank you chef thank you uh, for such a great explanation uh, next question i think this is the last question coming from mr virendra thapa he is asking yes. since lamb is used in most of non vegetarian kashmiri dishes which yes. one dish got the most popularity in india so i think the clearly the rogan josh has got the most uh, popularity because it uh, suits to everybody's taste because we can relate to it it's bright red in color and we all indians like lamb dishes which are bright red in color and rogan josh has some great flavors you know it is chilies it is fennel it is that hinka flavor it's cooked in little dahi um it has brown onion tomato so it reminds of us of our mutton curry the bhuna gosh uh, so it's very very tasty preparation so rogan josh is the one which has actually you know been popularized and it's available on every hotel's menu so i think that one dish i would say thank you chef one more question is there with your permission shall i take it please yes please yeah uh, th- this question is from mr krishna kumar student of icai tirupati uh, he is asking we could see that there are lot of famous savory dishes in wazwan uh, uh, what he understood from this session uh, are there any famous dessert or sweet dishes from wazwan cuisine you know uh, yes there are uh, sweet dishes in kashmir but again people are not very fond of sweet things uh, particularly because uh, they would rather enjoy fruits like apricots khubani cherries uh, and after eating so much of you know they rather would spend um, you know uh, their stomach on eating non vegetarian dishes uh, because the wazwan is such a amazing spread of so much of non veg that they don't want to waste their stomach on desserts which they can eat at home also but wazwan is something which is being cooked specially on that wedding day so they don't want to miss that chance but how were yeah few desserts like firni kashmiri firni is very different as it is made with uh, semolina and not rice in punjab you make it with rice in kashmir you make it with suji and it's saffron flavored so it's called uh, kong firn uh, the other very popular dessert of kashmir which is unheard by many other people is called the shukta so shukta are these cottage cheese pieces which are deep fried till they become crisp and then they are stewed in a honey flavored uh, syrup uh, flavored with lot of nuts like almonds walnuts so that is again a very very typical dessert of kashmir um, as kids in winters i remember you know we grew up on on this fruit called quince so quince is again something that's available in european countries you can hunt it up on the google to see they make quince jellies out of it so quince is not available ev- anywhere else in india neither in himachal everywhere it's only available in kashmir and uh, we used to call it bam suit in kashmiri we call it bam suit the english word is quince we used to take this quince and we used to put it in the charcoals then the chula and when the skin used to blister up we used to mash it with a spoon and add honey to it and malai and then eat it so that is very typical people make a halwa out of rubab Uh, in kashmir that's also very typical of kashmir 
और खुबानी खुबानी का मीठा इज अगेन वेरी वेरी टिपिकल ऑफ दिस मीट uh thank you chef so now all questions got over everybody is appreciating in a chat box and they are thank thanking you, you uh, for the great great session thank uh, you uh, only i apologize the people who are watching live facebook and yeah, youtube they can't uh, we are not uh, yeah uh, they, they they are if they are asking we are not taking those questions here no problem but uh, they can, they here, can uh, in this meeting room we have a they they can call me on yes, instagram please, i mean they can they can message me on instagram uh, i don't know how fast i can reply i have many messages pending on instagram but i will surely reply yes thank you yeah thank you thank you chef uh, so they will be in touch with you and there are some uh, uh, aspirants new aspirants culinary aspirants that question one question is for dr tirlok chandar uh, uh, sir question over to you that uh, when icia entrants going to happen two yeah. two people have asked this question no no actually and then we will uh, go for the vote of thanks no 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 dear uh, students actually you are applied for it i think this all depends of due to prevailing condition we have to uh, wait for a government directions government instruction as per the government instruction only we can conduct that uh, exam because this is a pan india jurisdictions Uh, there are so many other factors also we have to take into consideration before we announce a date because we should be able to reach maximum that's why we are waiting very soon we'll pray to god that normal sea returns something good happens we will uh, inform you well in advance either me or uh, dr munti or dr sunil we are in constant touch with our uh, candidates who are applying we will do it thank you very much uh, to, uh, directing the question to me but i have one question to the chef if you allow me only i will take on this Uh, yes chef, please can you hear me chef uh, yes yes my, i can yeah student I days can. this dish yes. is very popular that the mutton rogan josh even you are mentioning about it how rich is yes. that for recent days uh, chef i visited a few five star hotels for a kashmiri themed dinners the what about that rotten joke uh, chef nowadays it is used because some of the chefs are telling as you mentioned that uh, we are adding uh, kashmiri chili is no need to use it i like to have a uh, Uh, answer from you whether it is right or what is the uh, present status on rotan jo please no it is it it was never used i mean i don't know where this rotan jo thing has come into our uh, you know some of the hotels it was never used it is it is carcinogenic in nature so instead the mawal is something that is used which i described but rotan jo is never used in cooking okay. it only you know when it's an oil soluble color so the box of the rotan jo when you put hot oil over it the oil gets blood red in color so if some people are doing it i think these are the small time restaurants they want to make their things look bright but it is not something which is advisable not something which is healthy That's so right. one should not use ratan jyot yeah, this is a reason i have asked it because yeah. the future generation to take yeah. this message from you that it's not to be used yeah, very good not. this is a doubt i had very good yeah. i have uh, i got an opportunity yes. so once thank again you. Uh, thank you very much and thank I'll you Mr. Lumte, before uh, go to vote, yes, yeah, yes, chef. Again, yes, I like sir. to thank our organizing committee, director, chef, and one more important person that our uh, second year student, Mr. Uh, first year student, Jawad, mm -hmm. who had contributed this uh, digital posters. Actually, yeah. it was in uh, talent from him, where mm -hmm. we have the uh, talent, and he is able to do it a beautiful uh, uh, digital poster, where uh, our chef was looking very smart. So with this, I, I will hand over the session to Dr. Lumte. Please take over. Uh, thank you, Tripulok sir. Thank you, Chef. Now I thank invite uh, Chef Alok uh, Anupam Alok to propose vote of thanks. Now session over to Chef Anupam Alok. Thank you, Dr. Lumte. It was a very nice session for in the Bali. Thank It you. It was very nice. Hearing to you and uh, your views on Kashmiri cuisine. Uh, I, Chef Anupam Alok, faculty member at ICI Noida, on the behalf of the organizing committee and entire fraternity of the ICI family, extend my most sincere thanks to everyone for their valuable time and participation. It was thank you privilege to listen to you. I thank you, Chef Parvinder, for giving such. I'm looking forward to have more events in future with you 
and incorporating your ideas to enlighten us, the young minds. Thank My you. Our director, Sri Syamji Sinha. Sri Satyajit Sir, Director Academic Sensi Eighteen Sri and Sri Tulok Chandra Sir, Academic in Charge IC Eight Sri Satyajit. For your valuable guidance and support throughout the event, my dear students, you are the words giving you such inputs in this time of crisis where we would like to give you as much as possible because of the crisis we have not been able to, you know, take classes for you and uh, it has been a difficult time for you as well as us people not finding you in uh, presence and. Uh, guiding you through your uh, classes so i am very thankful to all the students for uh, participating and making this a uh, very success event webinar i also thank all the parents who have taken time and effort to participate in the webinar thank you everyone thank you off to dr lomte Sir, sir, we can end Thank the you. session. Yeah. Yes, can. Now we can go for end of meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.